greetings and welcome. We are in Senior English B. And our objective now is to begin an introduction to the great Victorian poet Robert Browning. And we are on page 979 in your hymnal, and we'll be treating his text, his text Last Duchess, uh, for the hour. Now, let me say a couple of quick observations, because you're going to look at... Uh, you're going to look at three offerings by Browning. The first one is on 979, the second is on 981, Life in a Love, and then the third one is on page 982, Porphyra's Lover. I wanna, uh, we're going we're gonna to focus primarily, though, on Last Duchess and Porphyra's Lover. Today, Last Duchess. Uh, I just want to make a couple of quick observations about Browning. Browning, pretty controversial poet. You're going to see this when you look at these two poems. Pretty controversial poet. He is going to love to work within the form of the dramatic monologue. So you want to write that down at 2B. That's an important one, the dramatic monologue. Okay, so uh, we'll be working with that one. Let me just point this out. On 976, uh, do you see under literary analysis where it says dramatic monologue? Do you see that? Any of this, any of this stuff at the beginning of a reading, you want to make sure you're always looking at the literary analysis stuff and you always want to look at the vocabulary. Do you see that at the bottom of the page? You always want to make sure you get these vocab words in your annotations so you're prepping for the exam because some of these vocab words are going to end up in the exam, right? Let's now look at uh, My Last Duchess, uh, Robert Browning's poem. I'm going to make a couple of general observations. We're going to read the poem and then we'll obviously exegete as we go. To appreciate a dramatic monologue, one more time, you have a single speaker speaking. You can remember at 3A if you want to, that uh, Ulysses, Tennyson's Ulysses, was a dramatic monologue, right? You have a single speaker speaking. There's two things that you're always looking for in a dramatic monologue. One, who is the person speaking? Two, what is the context, the dramatic context, for the person speaking? This is a little bit ambiguous in Last Duchess, and it's what makes the poem a little bit difficult to read. But once you know a few things, the poem is actually not that difficult to read. It's just very controversial to read. Let's take a look now at a couple of pieces of background information. The title itself says Duchess. Now, what is a Duchess? Write down your definition at level one. What is a Duchess? Are you at all familiar with that? A Duchess is a woman who is married to a what? Does anybody know? Uh, that is to say a duke. Uh, what, uh, in other words, someone who is rich or poor. Very rich. So let's write this down. A duchess is simply the wife of a duke who is going to be exceptionally wealthy. Right? Now, if, if, uh, if I start talking about a, a woman and I call her my last wife, what does that mean? Jot down in your notes what that means. My last wife. Like that's before, right? Last wife. In other words, you can kind of assume that what I'm saying is what about her? She's gone, either dead or de dead or no longer my wife, right? Okay. In other words, I'm, I'm moving on, okay? So in this poem, the first thing we need to understand is the dramatic context. The speaker of our poem is a very wealthy man. He has a history of wealth in his family. He is going to be speaking to someone, you want to write this down, he is going to be speaking to someone who never talks in the poem. Again, um, dramatic monologue. But it's not altogether clear who he's speaking to until the end of the poem. All right? So we've got to look at the poem closely to get some sense of what's going on. Let's now read the poem together. I'm with you on page 979. And let's see if we can start to figure out a little bit of what's going on. Read with me now, 979, My Last Duchess. And that's My Last Duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. So right away, let's just say it out loud. He and this other person are going to look at a portrait painting of his wife. Only guess what? She's not around anymore. Right, she's not around anymore. He keeps the picture on a wall behind a curtain and he opens the curtain up for this person. Who is this person? We don't know that yet. 
Now, right away, we're going we're gonna to learn some interesting things about this speaker of this poem. Let's read it together. That's my last duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. I call that piece a wonder now. Fra Pendall's hands worked busily a day, and there she stands. Will it please you sit and look at her? I sent Fra Pendolf by design, for never read strangers like you that pictured countenance, the depth and passion of its earnest glance, but to myself they turn, since none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you but I. And seemed as they would ask me if they durst, how such a glance came there. So not the first are you to turn and ask thus. Sir, t'was not her husband's presence only. Call that spot of joy into the duchess cheek. Perhaps Fra Pandolf chanced to say, her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much, or paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half-flush that dies along her throat. Such stuff was courtesy, she thought, and cause enough for calling up that spot of joy. She had a heart, how shall I say, too soon made glad, too easily impressed. She liked whate'er she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. Sir, t'was all one. My favor at her breast, the drooping of the daylight in the west, the bow of some of, of cherry, some officious fool, bro broke in the orchard for her, the white mules she rode with round the terrace, all and each would draw from her alike the approving speech, or blush at least. She thanked men, good, but thanked somehow, I, I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of a 900-year-old name with anybody's gift. Who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling? Even had you skill in speech, which I have not, to make your will quite clear to such a one and say, just this or that and you disgusts me, here you miss or there exceed the mark. And if she let herself be lessened so, nor plainly set her wits to yours forsooth and made excuse, even then would be some stooping, and I choose never to stoop. Oh, sir, she smiled, no doubt, whene'er I passed her, but who passed without much the same smile? This grew. I gave command. Then all smiles stopped together. There she stands as if alive. Will it please you rise? We'll meet the company below. Then I repeat the count of your master's mun known munificence is ample warrant that no one just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed, though his fair daughter self, as I have vowed at starting, is my object. Nay, we'll go together down, sir. Notice Neptune, though, taming a seahorse, thought a rarity which Klaus of Innsbruck cast in bronze for me. Now, okay, we've read this poem, and if you are a student who has a somewhat puzzled look on your face, like, what did we just read? You're in good company. But I want to point out, this poem is actually fairly accessible once you start paying closer attention to what the guy says. There's going to be a lot that's interesting about what he doesn't say. Are you familiar with Freudian slip? Freud said sometimes we say things without meaning to say things. We're going to learn a lot about this guy. And then in the process, we're going to learn a lot about Browning's view of male-female gender roles in Victorian England. So we're going to pay attention, first of all, to just what this cat's saying. Go back to 790, or 979. Let's just work through this for just a moment, all right? By the way, reading a little bit of background at the top will help you maybe. Notice it says, this poem set in the 16th century, you'd want that in your notes, in a castle in northern Italy, you'd want that in your notes, is based on events from the life of the Duke of Ferreira, a nobleman whose first wife died after just three years of marriage. Following his wife's death, the Duke began making arrangements to remarry. In Browning's poem, the Duke is showing a painting of his first wife, or as the poem calls it, title, last wife, to an agent, you'll want to write that down, see, who represents the father of the woman he hopes to marry. All right? So you want to write this down in your notes right away. Your background information here, this is a high school anthology, and so they sometimes feel like maybe high school students are a little inept to be able to figure everything out on their own. And so they're going to tell you a lot of what's going on. Well, this little introduction tells us several things. One, you got a duke who, whose wife is now passed. Two, he's looking for his next wife. Three, an agent or representative has been sent to meet with him and the family of that girl and the girl herself are downstairs waiting to meet him. Right? His next wife. Potentially his next wife. All right? In the conversation then that will ensue, you've got this rich man 
who is going to talk about his last wife. And the way he sets it up is by showing a portrait. Now, back in this time, wealthy people would bring in a painter, an artist. You had to sit. Man, this was tough. You had to sit for long hours over many, many days while the painter would paint you. The problem, of course, was that you couldn't have a portrait painted in one sitting. And so you would sit there motionless, right? They would paint for a while, maybe several hours, and then you would get up and go through the rest of your day, and then you'd come back the next day, and then you had to sit down the exact same way again. You had to hold your face the same way. You had to have the same clothes on. That's the only way that the painter could be able to do this. It cost a lot of money to have one of these painted, right? And if you've ever seen any of these great uh, portraits, you're probably aware, right, uh, that Mona Lisa is a classic example of how authentically real these paintings will look, okay? We began. That's my last duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. Tells the reader what? She ain't alive. She's dead. I call that piece a wonder now, colon. Read with me closely. I'm teaching how to read closely. Colon. Fra Pandolf's hands worked busily a day, and there she stands. Can you guess in your notes who Fra Pandolf is? The he's the artist. Right? He's the painter, right? Fra Pandolf, he's a famous artist, okay? In other words, I brought in the best artist to paint my wife. Will it please you sit and look at her? Right? So you can kind of get the picture here. There's the bench. They're sitting down. They're looking at this picture as he talks. Keep reading with me. I sent Fra Pandolf by design. For never read strangers like you that picture countenance. Countenance means what? Picture face. Pictured countenance, the depth and passion of its earnest glance, but to myself they turned. Parenthetic, are you reading it with me close? Since none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you but I, in parenthetic, and seemed as they would ask me if they durst, how such a glance came there. So not the first are you to turn and ask thus. Now, two things about these lines. One, he says, I mentioned Fra Pandolf for a reason. In other words, he likes name dropping. Why would he like name dropping? Write it down. What's this tell you about him already? Yeah, he's in the bank, and he likes to let you know that he's in the bank. He has money. Fra Pandolf, he says, I mentioned that name intentionally. Secondly, did you see what he says in parenthetics? What's he saying in parenthetics? Look at it. What's he saying in parenthetics? He says, since none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you but I. What's that tell you? What kind of cat is this already? You can already get a sense of this guy. What, how would you say it? He's into power, isn't he? Right? He's into power. No, ain't nobody touches this curtain but me. Right? Finally, he makes the observation that the question had already been asked about the painting of this woman. Wow, she has in her cheeks like this red that's so lifelike, like blood just immediately came to her cheeks right here. That's quite remarkable. And he says, you're not the first one to ask me about code language, how beautiful she was. In other words, she was hot. Yeah, you're not the first one, he says, to look at this painting and go, whoa, she is one beautiful woman. You're not the first one. And then from this point on in the rest of the poem, he's going to tell you about his wife, who now is, well, she ain't there. He hasn't used the word dead yet, has he? Right? Sir, t'was not her husband's presence only, Call that spot, and now turn to page 980, of joy into the duchess cheek. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. What's he say? This thing in her cheek, like blood going into her cheeks to make her look more beautiful. That didn't just happen because of me, he says. Keep reading. Perhaps the painter, Fra Pandolf, chanced to say, quote, her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much. In other words, it's possible that the painter started flirting with her and pulled the mantle up to show more of her arm. Or, paint must never hope, he was saying this, paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half flush that dies along her throat. In other words, you have such a beautiful throat. He was imagining. Maybe the artist said that to her, which is what called this up into her cheeks. Keep reading. Such stuff was courtesy, she thought, 
and cause enough for calling up that spot of joy. Now, starting at line 21, it's almost like he pauses and he's trying to remember what she was like. And now all of a sudden he's going to say some very interesting things which we're going to have to talk about. Look what he says at line 21. She had a heart, dash, how shall I say, dash, too soon made glad, too easily impressed. She liked whatever she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. Whoa, what did you just read? Put it in your own words. What does he say about his last life? That's one rendering. She likes to get around. I'm assuming you mean sexually, right? In other words, she played around. Yes. But go back and look at the lines more closely. What is it that he says specifically about what's wrong with her? She had a heart, how shall I say, too soon made glad, too easily impressed. She was too what? In a word, one word, she was too what? She was too, she was too happy. Right. <laughs> right, right. She smiled too much. What? She smiled too much? What do you mean she smiled? Well, look, this begs a really intriguing question. I asked this question a few years ago talking about this poem. I said, okay, right out here in the hall, you got the benches. It's lunchtime. Guy and girl been dating for, I don't know, let's call it five months. They're pretty serious. They have been around five months together and pretty exclusive together. They're sitting there talking, and all of a sudden she looks up, and three guys come walking down the hall. Let's just say that they're not ugly. Shall we say it that way? And one of the three guys looks at her and smiles, and she smiles back. And they just keep walking. Oh, that just did this. <laughs> oh, and the guy goes, whoa, 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 what was that about? She goes, what was what about? That, what you just did. What, what do you mean what I just did? The smiling thing. If a girl is with another guy, should she not smile at other guys? No. Smiling? Smiling? Miss Harry goes, why? Why couldn't a girl smile at another guy Smiling? Wait a minute. Let's just let's just ask for a quick second though. What about going the other direction? How about if it's the guy and the girl sitting there on the bench lunchtime right. and three <laughs> and three beautiful women come walking by? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, forget about high school. Let's just talk about it at the mall. How's that? So you're sitting at the mall, guy and girl sitting at the mall, three girls walk by. Catches the eye of the guy, and one of the three, let's just make this complicated by saying she's the most beautiful, and she just smiles at the guy. Doesn't say anything. Hernandez is just smiling now. He can't even think about this without smiling. And so, smiles, and so he does what's natural. He just smiles back. Oh, now her is not smiling anymore. Is it okay now? The guy just smiles. That's all he does. She smiles. <laughs> and the girl and the girlfriend says what I am so glad I get to sit at the mall with such a good-looking guy that other girls uh, like this is that what she says no. No. Uh oh uh oh Mr. Johnson just does this he's not saying it. he just does this now let's put it in our notes let's let's put it in our notes by the way for those of us who read this poem and then do one of these numbers sorry Mr. Beck that's going to be an interesting moment when you read the rest of this poem. But let's just get into it now by making a quick observation. This poem is obviously going to raise two really interesting questions. One, let's write them in our notes. One, to what degree is having a wife or a girlfriend possession? Possession. To what degree does a guy have the power over a girl to say, knock it off? Okay. To what degree, second question, to what degree does this poem suggest that guys have natural tendencies to be jealous? Okay? And how dangerous is that kind of jealousy? Okay? 
Now, let's keep going. She had a, I'll go back to it. She had a heart, how shall I say, too soon made glad, too easily impressed. She liked whatever she looked on her, no looks went everywhere. Sir, was all one. My favor at her breast, the dropping of the daylight in the west, the bow of cherry simmel fish's fool broke in the orchard for her, the white mule she rode with round the terrace, all in each would draw from her alike the approving speech or brush or blush at least. In other words, she was happy, he says, all the time. And she could be happy over anything. The sun going down, riding on a pony, some idiot servant brought her some cherries. She was happy all the time. Wait a minute, do you have a sense that he liked that she was happy? No. no. See, this starts to get a little disturbing. This guy doesn't seem to be really excited about the fact she smiled all the time. Look at what he says next. She thanked men, good. Notice the punctuations, dash, good. But think somehow, I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of a 900-year-old name with anybody's gift. Whoa, 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 what do you mean, 900-year-old name? What's this mean? A duke comes from money. What's he say? She didn't give me the proper respect for marrying her. Whoa. In other words, she should have known better that I was way more important than anything else in her life. And therefore, smiling all the time about everything? Notice he continues. He says, even had you skill in speech, line 25. Now this poem starts to get a little disturbing. Even had you skill in speech, notice parentheses, which I have not, irony here. In other words, I'm not a real good talker. We're obviously listening to a very fine talker. But he says, even if you had the ability to talk to her, which he says I didn't, to make your will quite clear to such a one and say, quote, just this or that in you disgusts me, here you miss or there exceed the mark. And if she let herself be lessened so, in other words, even if she would have listened to me talking about it, nor plainly set her wits to yours forsooth and made excuse, even then would be some stooping, and I choose never to stoop. Oh, whoa, whoa, what does he, what did you just read? He says, I could have told her to knock it off with the smiling, but to tell her would have meant for me stooping down to her level. And I don't stoop. Whoa, whoa, what's he really saying in code language? I asked this question a while ago about guy girls sitting in the halls and girl walks by and smiles and the guy, or a guy, a guy walks by, three guys walk by and the girl smiles. Interestingly, one of the guys in the class said it this way. No, she shouldn't smile. It's simple, why not? She should know better. Right, everybody in the room kind of went, whoa, 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 what do you mean she should know better? And he continued, he said, come on, everybody knows this. I set up my scenario intentionally by saying they've been exclusively dating for five months and they're serious. And he said, when you say that, that means she should know better. She's not allowed to smile at other guys. She's with that guy. What did he say? What was fascinating was that a number of the guys in the room kind of went, yeah. And a number of the girls in the room were like, what? You can't even smile? And the guy said, here's the deal. You shouldn't as a guy have to say that. The girl should already know that because she's with the guy. Mm, that's what he's just said. He says, I could have told her, I could have said, knock it off, but that would have been like stooping, and I don't stoop. I got a 900-year-old name. Now, already, you can begin to invent some adjectives for this guy. What kind of guy is this guy? Go ahead and write it in your notes. What kind of guy is this guy? He is somewhat narcissistic. Keep going. What else do you want to say about him? He's cocky. He's arrogant. Very arrogant, isn't he? By the way, what does that mean, and if she let herself be lessened so? If she would have listened to me. What, is he, what does it kind of tell us about her? Not only was she happy all the time, but she was fairly what? She was independent. She was an independent gal. She wasn't so quick to want to listen to what her husband had to say. And he figured that out, right? He knew that about her. 
And, he, and I, sir, choose never to stoop. Even if there would be some stooping, he says, I choose never. Oh, sir. Uh-oh, here we go. We'll finish now. She smiled, no doubt, whene'er I passed her. But who passed without much the same smile? Oh. What did he want from her? He wanted her really happy when she was with him. There it is. And less happy when she wasn't with him. Now, 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 now we go, now we come to the most disturbing lines of the poem. This grew. What grew? I'm reading it together right now, line 45. This grew. What grew? Our happiness. Yeah, the smiling problem. This grew. I gave commands. Then all <laughs> smiles stopped together. There she stands as if alive. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What did you just read? This grew. I gave commands. <laughs> then all smiles stopped together. There she stands as if alive. Whoa. She smiled too much. She should have known better. He gave commands. The smiling stopped. There she stands as if alive. Oh. I called it already. Whoa. He kills her or has her killed because she's what? She's too happy. She's too happy. Wait a minute. That's what he says, too happy. What really was wrong with her? Put it in your own words, in your notes. What really is wrong with her? She's a jerk. Keep going. That's his perception, is that she is a jerk. But those of us who read this poem are more inclined to side with who? Well, it's an interesting question. A lot of male readers of this poem of Browning's Day sided with this guy. Like, what's, what's the problem? <laughs> That's right. That's right. But there were a lot of other readers of this poem that said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. It isn't that she's too happy. That isn't why he has her killed. Why does he really have her killed? Anybody? She can't be what? She can't be controlled. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I think it's interesting that the word trust is the one that some guys will throw out. But let's be fair. This isn't a matter of trust. It's a matter of control. He can't control her. And because he can't control her... He can't control her. He gets rid of her. But wait a minute. We still got lines of the poem left. There she stands as if alive. Will it please you rise? Who's he talking to? Who's he talking to? He's talking to an agent who's been sitting looking at this painting. Why is the agent in the house? Keep reading. We'll meet the company below. What company? Dude, he's been telling this guy what he did. And this is the guy who represents the family of the next wife. He, we'll keep reading. Then I repeat, the count your master's known munificence is ample warrant that no one just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed. I will pay any amount of money to get the girl I want. That's what dowry is. Though his fair daughter self, as I avowed, its starting is my object. Whoa, whoa, whoa. He's been telling us what he did to his last wife to the guy who's about to set up his next marriage. So the guy, agent man, that's his objection. Well, you get the sense. That's, that's a fine point. That makes a fine point. When you tell a story like this, you're sending a message not only to your next wife, mm -hmm. but to the people who are making the arrangements for your next wife. In other words, I don't want to have to deal with this problem again. What problem? That my wife smiles too much? Yeah, that's only half the problem. The real problem is, can you control her? Keep reading. Nay, we'll go down together, sir. Notice Neptune, though, taming a seahorse, thought a rarity, which Klaus of Ensbruck cast in bronze for me. Klaus of Ensbruck, another famous artist. In other words, as he goes down, he goes, hey, look at another work of art that I've got right here. Now, it's significant that Browning has our speaker talking about works of art as he goes down the stairs to go get his next. In what way does this guy think about his women as his art? Write it down. Do you think 
guys at Worland High School think about their girlfriends as possessions? Are they possessions? When the girl is with the guy, is that a possession? Does she have the right to do whatever she wants? If she's with the guy. The girl does not have the right to do whatever she wants. So she's a slave. <laughs> Dude, I'm sorry. Either you have the right to do whatever you want. You just run it by me and I give it to go. Oh. So she is a slave. Not a slave, but she can't do what she wants. Uh, on what? Everything from... His mood. Oh, now you know me. <laughs> it has to do with the Duke. Everything comes through the Duke. The Duke gets to decide what the Duchess can do and cannot do. Right or wrong? Everything? Even smiling? Even smiling? <laughs> now, let's point out something. One or two modern readers of this poem will often look at it and say, seriously, a girl can't smile? A girl can't be independent-minded? A guy has to tell her what to do? And a lot of modern readers of this poem will say, how would anybody put up with that kind of crap? Of course, hello, we're reading from a different time period. This is 1850. And in 1850, we're talking about a Victorian view of women that says, Women are given by their fathers to their husband, and women are the husband's possession, to be treated with as only the man wants. She does what she's told to do. Question. This poem, however, became very, very controversial for its day. Because lots of male readers who treated their wife this way, maybe not killing them, but certainly not pleased they were happy or independent-minded, had to come with, to, to terms with the, the speaker of this poem. Do you agree with this speaker? If you're a, a reader of Browning's Day, do you agree with it? Do you go, yeah, that's how you're supposed to treat your woman? Or are you more inclined to say, whoa, 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 this is just a little bit over the top. I, you know, I, my wife, I, I don't mind if she smiles as long as, oh, wait. What is with trying to control our women? But now I'm going to ask a more intriguing question. Women readers of this poem. Now we're going to ask this about both these Browning texts we're going to look at. This one in Prefere's Lover tomorrow. But women readers of this poem. They would look at this poem and read and think how. Write it down. How would a female reader of this poem. By the way, it's fascinating. I read this poem to you and there is no way I had the looks that I'm having from you now. Now that you know what the poem means, do you get me? Once you've read it and you understand it, you go, ah, oh, Browning is playing a wicked, nasty game, especially with female readers. What's the obvious question about the girl down below who's about to marry this cat? Does she have any idea what she's about to get? Zero. Right? Zero. Which begs a really intriguing question. Does a woman ever really know a man until she's with him for a while? But what happens if she is with him for a while and all of a sudden he's like, whoa, 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 you don't get an opinion until I give it to you. Like then what? Then what? <laughs> Can a girl know a guy before? Yeah. See? How has times changed since this poem? For example, if a, if a girl at well, in high school is with a guy and a guy says, you're not smiling anybody but me, a lot of times she might do what? Yeah, just say I'm out of here. Right? I'm out of here. Do you think do you think it's still the case that guys try to control their girls? Why? What do you think? Why? Why would a guy try to control his girl? Guys have to assert their dominance. Alpha male. Alpha male. You're saying times have changed. This grew, I gave commands. Okay, guys, there you go. An introduction to Last Duck.